Cabo Verde. This small fishing village, nestled on the shores of the Atlantic Ocean, is significant to every Cabo Verdean, as this is where their very existence originated. It is here in Ciudad Velha, on the island of Santiago, that 518 years ago, Portuguese ships dropped anchor and brought their precious cargo to be traded. Cargo being African children, young women, and men, being bought for the sole purpose of slavery. Looking out at the sea are the remains of the fortress built by the Portuguese for the purpose of keeping their cargo safe. The fort still looks as it did centuries ago while the cannons silently stand guard by the solid rock wall. From high up on a hill, we see the village as it stands today. The people still live as their ancestors did centuries ago with very few evident changes. The houses they live in are similar to those built all those years ago, walls of stone and roofs made with sugarcane leaves. white person in this village is still quite a novelty. The children were all very open in their curiosity, touching my bare arms and legs and staring at my blue eyes in disbelief. The majority of people in this village very rarely wear shoes and have no trouble in walking on rocks, hot sand, or playing soccer without the aid of footwear. Only 10 miles away, or half an hour by bus, is the capital city of Prior, second largest city in all of Cabo Verde. The buildings have been strongly influenced by the European architecture, which is quite a contrast from the small villages. a typical street in Prior, which is all built out of stone and has been constructed completely by hand. This is the main thoroughfare heading towards the market and shops. The trees have been planted to protect the pedestrians from the sun and add some character to the town. These vehicles are the people's main source of transportation to the various outlying villages. People just sit on hard wooden boards for trips that can take up to three to four hours, sometimes longer. From here we can see the outside of the market early in the morning. People are just arriving from other villages to sell their goods or buy their supplies. It is an open-air market which sells not only produce, such as green bananas, sweet potatoes, manaka, but all your everyday staples and an odd assortment of clothes and shoes. 
Meat and fish must be purchased from outside the market in closed stalls. Not too far from the market is the main square and park, situated in front of the government building. Here you can find a shoe shine or have a beer in the sidewalk cafe. Here in Pryor there are many young people from the various islands completing their education. Once outside the big towns, the main source of income comes from farming and fishing. While in the village of Terrafal, we were fortunate to see the fishermen bringing in a huge turtle. It was slaughtered right on the beach and sold within 20 minutes, so it was guaranteed fresh. With the lack of modern machinery, all the heavy work which is normally carried out by powerful diggers and bulldozers must be completed by human strength. This is back-breaking work, especially in the intense summer heat. As for the women, they too must use their hands for their everyday tasks. They must first fetch the water from the well, which they will carry on their heads to wherever they will do the day's wash. After everything is washed, they are spread to dry on the ground, secured by rocks. Whatever dirt is on the clothes when dry is just shaken off. These women are on their way, way home, perhaps only half a mile away, but some must carry their water for up to six miles every day. Here this young girl sits and contemplates her future, which most young Cape Verdes are doing these days. This banana crop is situated amongst the barren soil but has been irrigated mechanically from water being drilled from the ground. Most of the bananas are cut while still green and used in the everyday meals as a vegetable. Also found here are papaya trees and mangoes. This is a construction site on the outskirts of Villa Brava. Here they are building a housing complex in a modern design compared to the average home. The main material being used are cement bricks with a smaller portion of rock. Notice the women not only use their heads for water but aid in carrying the rocks to the upper portion of the complex. The men here will be averaging $2 per day for this farmer, etc., will live in homes similar to this one. These two to three room homes will sleep a family of eight with a separate room for cooking alongside. In the back there is usually found a couple of chickens, ducks, and the usual mule, and an odd assortment of animals. The well-to-do Cape Verdeans can be found living in homes such as these. In every village or town, no matter how small, there is always a church to be found, the majority being Catholic, approximately 85%, the other 15% being Protestant. Here the village schoolyard is buzzing with noon hour activities. Only a 33% of the total population attend school, and by the end of the fifth year, the attendance drops to 21%. Due to the fact that at one time 15% of the population was made up of white Portuguese and British inhabitants, the physical appearances of today's Cape Verdeans are widely varied. This is one of the three cars found in the village, the rest of the vehicles being trucks. Compared to the prior market, Villa Brava looks almost empty. To buy anything, you must be there very early in the morning.
have many valuable uses in any village, not only for transportation and carrying heavy loads, but they play a major role in the making of the national alcoholic beverage called grog. Through these heavy presses, the sugar cane is pressed until every drop is squeezed out and is caught in a trough below. Then the fermented juices are boiled over an open fire. As it passes down through a copper pipe, it is cooled by a constant flow of water, which creates the alcohol. This pool is a deposit for irrigation but is used as a pastime for the young boys who enjoy cooling off after a hot day. Just outside the kitchen, Mathilde and I try to get a wave and a smile from Nadia, but she's having an off day, as always. She knows we're leaving tomorrow, so she's not very happy. Maria and I are preparing kachupa for the evening meal. The dried corn is being pounded to loosen the outer skin, which will then be shaken off, and finally the finished product is cooked for three to five hours, similar to how we cook dried beans. For most people, this will be all they can afford to eat for dinner and breakfast, with fish and an occasional piece of meat. After dinner, Bettina and I take a stroll through the park in an attempt to get Nadia drowsy for the evening sleep. There was never any lack of babysitters while we were there. Nadia was always the most popular in demand. Looking down the valley is an overall view of Villa Brava, which is the largest village in all of San Nicola. After suffering more than 10 years of drought, most of the islands are dry and barren, where at one time the valleys were rich with banana, coconut, papaya, etc. Being of volcanic origin and being so mountainous, there is little farmland, but with use of terracing, every worthwhile piece is used.
There are, with the aid of moder modern technology, some valleys producing the country's supply of produce. Without these, Cape Verde would have to depend totally on importing. Virtually all of the beaches are unspoiled due to the noticeable lack of tourism, with only the occasional guest house to be seen. Being only four years independent from the Portuguese restraint, the majority of the younger generation fully support the new government policies. However, the majority of the older population resent the takeover as they felt more secure with the Portuguese regime. Tourism is perhaps one of the many answers to Cape Verde's poverty and stunted development, but until a decision is made, life for every person will continue as it has been doing for the past few centuries.